Hey, Brad, how you doing? Welcome back. Let's have another great episode of uh, Coffee with Catapult. How are you doing today? I am uh, doing well. I'm uh, I'm drinking uh, coffee uh, this morning. Uh, it's uh, in a wine uh, glass, but it's actually <laughs> coffee. Um, I'm, wor- I'm working with the end of a protein shake, so uh, <laughs> yeah, I had my so, coffee earlier. Um, the uh, One of the uh, companies that I'm uh, on their board, uh, Citadel Environmental, uh, called Citadel EHS out of California. Nice, really nice folks. They sent out a, a whole kit and part of uh, it was uh, this this thing, which is actually keeping my coffee warm for hours, which is new for me, but um, nice. because normally nice. I just drink it fast and it's gone. But uh, <laughs> today it's, um, it's, it's lasting. So maybe that's good. I'll drink a little less, a yeah. uh, little less coffee. So, gotcha. gotcha. Um, well, let's dive uh, in. Let's, let's we want to do a, yeah, look, we wanted to talk a little bit about uh, this this conversation around revenue growth and margins not necessarily following the same pattern of revenue growth, right? I mean, you've, you've harped it's on- It's sure on us an and, interesting conversation, Daryl, for, for sure. And uh, as, yeah. as you know, um, I spend a good amount of my time working with uh, growth companies, uh, typically with the, uh, the owner, founder, operator, which is all the- same person uh, in this case, but uh, right. in entrepreneurial firms, uh, usually revenues of five to say a hundred million or thereabouts. Um, and, and the story is uh, often uh, the same. And so I thought uh, uh, we, we might have a conversation about math today and, and probably uh, now you hear click of people uh, disconnecting. Uh, <laughs> Sign up for the math, math class. <laughs> but at, you know, at the end of the day, you, uh, you know, uh, in business, uh, we 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 measure and we we measure mathematically the results of uh, of the company, right? So we we turn the sales and operations and and overheads and the resultant that flows through from that into a mathematical equation we call the profit and loss statement, right? And and then at the end, we end up with profit, which is not necessarily the same as cash, but it's a good start. And um, <laughs> that's kind of the, 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 the yardstick for, uh, for measuring uh, results in a, in a business. It's not the only one, but it, it is a one. Mm-hmm. And um, so uh, the, through this, this experience of working with lots of entrepreneurs, Gerald, I, I have these, these, repetitive uh, conversations over a uh, continuum of, of many people. And, and it usually starts with, um, you know, re- revenues up, but profits not. And, right. you know, sales uh, is good. I, I think that's, that's the first thing, right. That we need uh, to generate profit, no sales, no, no, no money, no profit, right. but <clears throat> the, the equation, which is really quite simple right, is sales or revenue, less a, um, an expense category called cost of goods sold, which is simply defined as the um, funds or dollars used to produce the good or service, labor, materials, mm-hmm. and typically in some equipment, in some instances, or an allocation uh, of equipment. Mm-hmm. Um, and when you subtract that, you get an, an, an a number that's called gross profit. And, and there's, you hear a lot of people uh, had conversation about profit, gross profit and gross margin. So gross profit is a measurement in dollars and gross margin. Daryl is uh, a measurement in percentage. Mm-hmm. Um, and I've heard, well, my margin is good, but profit is not. The next category below that is overhead. So I love to look at things in, in terms of gross profit dollars, because we can't spend margin percentage, we can spend margin dollars, dollars, right? And <laughs> right. so it's, it's a kind of a weird conversation, but I think framing um, the, the math in this fashion helps uh, entrepreneurs look at it. And I know most people are aware of this. It's not a complicated uh, formula. It's just addition and subtraction. But where it counts is, is that we have to have sufficient gross profit dollars to cover the amount of overhead and any excess of that, any excess when you subtract overhead from the the margin dollars, the gross profit is profit. That's what you get to keep. Um, And for simplification, let's just call that that it was in cash and not held up in accounts receivable or something along those lines. Okay, so um, 
so the conversation is often um, uh, twofold. One is, is, am I creating sufficient margin percentage, right? Is my gross margin good? And the answer to that typically is it depends. And it depends on what your overhead structure is, right? So interesting um, way to look at it, right? So if your overhead structure is running 25% of, of sales, and let's just use a simple calculation for this. For example, say you have a million dollars in sales, you're running a 25% overhead, you have $250,000 of, of overhead, right? Okay. So that's your hurdle, right? That's what you got to clear in gross profit dollars in order to make a profit. My, it all making I, 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 the math that you got, the math is making sense. I hope. Um, yeah, absolutely. Uh, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. And, and so Daryl, from, from, from this equation, we have to talk about two things. One is, is the margin uh, sufficient? So are we creating enough margin to do it? So if we had 18% margin on a million dollars in sales, we'd only create $180,000 of gross profit dollars, not enough. But if we had 18% margin on $2 million in sales, we'd have $360,000 of gross margin dollars and a sufficient amount to cover overhead and make a small profit. So it depends, right? Okay. I think it's important though, when you look at overhead, um, one of the uh, propensities is to say, I've got to reduce overhead. I've got to reduce overhead. And that may be true in areas that it's wasteful, but a certain mm. amount of infrastructure is required to operate the business. So sometimes cutting overhead too razor thin is actually contraindicated for growth companies. Right, right. Um, and, I, and you've heard me say this before, that no good company was ever made from just cost cutting alone, right? It Absolutely. Just doesn't, it, it, it doesn't Absolutely. work. What we want to do is have a value add in the marketplace that, Right. That, that customers freely put a higher value on so you're not commoditized, right? And, and you can provide a high level product and, and or service. Mm -hmm. Okay, so overhead matters. And overhead um, has to, in my opinion, be at a level that allows the company to grow. So there's certain capacities in the overhead structure that in my opinion have to be in place in order for a company to experience any level of growth. If there is no capacity, there is no growth. And I think that's a really important statement. Yeah, let me see if I can say it another way. It, you have to be able to flatline expenses to a certain degree and be able to add some revenue that doesn't just automatically pull the expense line up. Uh, it is another way that I'm hearing you say it, which is every time you make more revenue, you can't just drag the the revenue, the expense line up, because otherwise you still end up with the same problem of gross revenue or uh, sorry, gross profit still staying flat, or even in some cases declining because you exceed revenue or you exceed the expense line too fast. Right. And that, that's with uh, the overhead, right? That yes. the, the gross profit, right? So the, the revenue less the cost of goods sold equals mm -hmm. gross profit. Uh, I, I would say it depends on the elasticity of, of the revenue in terms right. of does the pricing make a huge difference in terms of the, the acceleration of sales or not. Right. All right. With regard to overhead, it really is structural in terms of do we have a, a, enough customer service, for example, enough billing people, enough uh, of that structure that allows for growth. And in that, I think there needs to be some cushion. So the sizing of the structure of the company has to be predicated upon where you're going, not necessarily where you're at. Mm. The problem when you do that is it puts pressure on, on, on net margin because we're putting a structure in. Say you're a $30 million company, yet you have a $40 million kind of structure. You're built for $40 million. But you have a lot of overhead that you're, you're hoping that those, those sales and corresponding gross profit dollars can absorb, right? So what's the trajectory to go from your current level of sales right. to that level of sales and kind of grow into the business? Mm -hmm. Very difficult question because there's a lot of I don't knows 
uh, mm-hmm. that, that come out of it. But I think we can, we can reasonably ask, are we going to grow quickly enough? How long is this going to happen? What is the level of investment in terms of dollars and time uh, to get there? And then is the margin sufficient? And, and again, it depends on what the level of overhead. If you have very small overhead, you can tolerate potentially a yeah. smaller margin up right. top in, in an effort to, uh, to produce uh, better sales. So um, there's a long drawn out way of saying margins matter, but also overhead matters uh, in, in the total equation of uh, you got to run to, to a, to a net profit at some place. Right. Um, anyhow, uh, I guess where I'm going for that is, is that it's done well in growth companies when the action is done intentionally when you can forecast what you're doing, you understand what you're doing, you understand the level of investment, you know where the overhead is set, you know where the, uh, the changes to overhead uh, occur over a continuum of, of sales revenue. And then you can look at the margins and answer the question is, are they appropriate? Are they gonna throw off enough gross margin dollars, mm-hmm. gross profit dollars, to cover that overhead and provide a reasonable amount of profit. Yeah. You spend a lot of time with, uh, you know, each of the companies that are in your, in your, um, advisory group and, and every scenario is different, right? You know, someone who's in a project based business versus a software business, uh, you know, all of those scenarios matter that, um, and it is going to be an individual basis, but, in theory, what you're saying is the structure has to be able to support that future growth. And a lot of times you're going to be forwarding cost structure ahead of the growth, but you've got to have a very good forecasting model, a very good forecasting system. Um, and I think obviously, depending on where the business is and stages, what, at least what when we're sitting around our groups talking, you know, a lot of times it's sometimes looking in the rear view mirror, trying to plan what we're doing going forward, as opposed to being forward thinking uh, where we can accelerate growth and know what we're going to build into. Right. So the, the key is, is to um, be mindful, right, of the structure required to get to the next level in business without running out of cash. It's, mm-hmm. it's can you tolerate the level of investment right. required? And often the answer to that question is kind of like how hard you're able to step on the accelerator, right? right? So some businesses are more expensive, they're more capital intensive. They use more cash to grow than others. Some uh, have very low pressure on, on cash to grow, to add incremental sales. Some have high and it really depends. And so, yeah, the conversation uh, is different, but the math is always uh, the same. And so um, math matters in this case. Exactly. You know, and I, I just want to say this uh, before we wrap up, you know, you've now been, you know, advised, well, first of all, you, you know, you've built several companies yourself. Now you've been advising companies for over a decade and the, uh, the, the track record uh, in all of the scenarios, service business, software business, product business. I mean, you, you've got this dialed in such that those variables, that seems to be your, your sweet spot to come in and, and look and assist uh, these uh, growth-driven entrepreneurs with understanding and, and helping them assess. I think it's one of the best things you bring to the table is your ability to sit outside the frame and bring your perspective in and, man, just identify those one, two, or three elements re- relative to that bigger structure, whether whether it's pivoting, uh, bringing up those, hey, have you considered uh, very, very uh, instrumental the value that you play in the roles with these uh, with these companies, uh, mine included. So, uh, very good conversation today. Any anything else you want to add along this uh, this topic today? Um, yes, forecast, forecast, forecast. Uh, I think you have to be looking out to the future, look at the effects on uh, both cash and profitability, and what's the level of investment. And I, I also think you have to um, say your own personal uh, tolerance for risk and uh, also for wobble. Um, there are very few companies, very few, that have directly linear progressions. Hmm. And yeah. as a result of that, we have ebbs and flows along the way. Yeah. Uh, I think everything uh, comes in due time uh, with some good planning. 
but you should always plan on twice as much time and twice as much money. <laughs> and if you do that and your model still works, then you got something. That a way to run everybody off, Brad. Yeah. <laughs> that to pop the balloon. <laughs> Give it twice as much time, twice as much. No, it's it's true though. It's true. I mean, uh, the business of business is is it's a it's a marathon. It's not it's not a sprint. And if you take a sprint route, there's going to be usually some some exhaustion and and sometimes some unintended consequences. Right. There's almost always a way. And so I think uh, with with adequate uh, thought applied and good strategy. Um, up is, up is an appropriate direction. Sounds good. Sounds good. Where can people find you, Brad? They want to connect with you. Uh, you're running a, a uh, suite of, uh, you're running an advisory board, peer advisory group, uh, 17 to 20 entrepreneurs a year are getting advice from you and, and your, your, your team. Uh, you know, I'm on the inside, but uh, for those that are on the outside who maybe want to see it on the inside, where can they find you? Well, that's a good question. So uh, we for, we have a website at catapultgroups.com. That's probably the simplest place. But uh, we provide uh, this peer advisory board uh, in the greater Las Vegas area. Uh, and then uh, our my, myself and, and associates uh, can do business coaching, advising pretty much nationwide, particularly now uh, that we're getting good at this uh, digital format. <laughs> so, right. Thank you, Colin. Um, yeah, well... <laughs> Um, few things, a uh, few, th few good things have happened. Uh, and, uh, I think this video conferencing is one of them. So, yeah, absolutely. Hey, if you're watching this episode of uh, coffee with catapult and your business is looking for that next level of growth and looking for someone who's not just talking the talk, he's walked the walk, built several companies. His partners have built several companies. These guys know what they're talking about. Uh, I'm privileged to say they've been an advisor to my company now for almost seven years. I think Brad, I can't even keep up. Yeah, we, uh, we both had hair you. back then, if you remember. <laughs> you know, I was going to say it. I don't know if the, uh, pandemic, the <laughs> pandemic messed it up. So <laughs> anyway, uh, reach out to Brad at catapultgroups.com. And uh, Brad, we'll see you on the next episode of Coffee with Catapult. Thanks, Daryl. Have a good one.